fussy. Okay, I'm just going to go over this again really quickly for those who weren't here. So, just a quick review about this one. Um, this question is testing on whether you testing on whether or not you realize things like um, because these are equal resistors here and here, they're going to have equal voltages, meaning that the currents here and here, whoops, through here and here are going to be basically half of what they are here. Currents here and here are going to be the same. Long story short, um, the current is highest here and here, and those currents are the same. And the voltages are this, um, therefore the highest on the two circled. Quick little note here: the voltage across this guy is zero because this is an equipotential across that. Okay, moving on. Okay, so an object placed five centimeters in front of a lens with a ten centimeter focal length. So what you're going to be doing here is just a quick sketch. Uh, you're going to get rulers. A problem like this, you would have a ruler in, on your final exam. You know, you would measure 10 centimeters, whatever that happens to be, measure 10, put the focal points, put the object at a measured 5, and then draw the, uh, and then just sketch it, looking for where the image is. Now, the point of this problem isn't about applying the thin lens equation. This is just about how to do the ray diagrams. Um, and that's why it says estimate the final location and describe whether it's a virtual or a real. I'm not going to do that for you, but that's, we'll see if you can do that here in class. And for those of you who are just watching this over video, try it. And if you can't get it, you know, send me a text and uh, be happy to go over it with you. Bohr theory is something that we did not get to at this point and will not be on your final exam. As I just told the class, however, I'm going to be um, assigning a video on this. It's not going to be on your final exam. You don't need to worry about this. I do want to at least get you some exposure to uh, Bohr theory of the atom. It's an important part of physics, too, but you don't have to worry about it as far as your final exam is concerned. So this one right here is just designed to test your knowledge on um, classifications of, of uh, different electromagnetic radiations. So we're trying to classify these from lowest energy to highest. So you've got to decide, you know, which of these you think is the lowest energy and then the next lowest and then the next lowest and so forth. I usually, I don't, with the exception of visible spectrum 700 to 9, I'm sorry, 400 to 700 nanometers, I never make people memorize actual cutoffs. And by the way, the cutoffs for these aren't, aren't hard line cutoffs anyway, they, they overlap, but Anyway, long story short, for number five, ask yourself which of these is the lowest energy, the next lowest, and so forth. Number six, put an X where you believe the net electric field will be zero. There's no math required for this. What you want to do is, I'm going to pick like three points here, like A, B, C. The point of this problem is, is kind of twofold. One, can you tell electric field directions for both charges at all three of those points? And you should be able to eliminate one of those points immediately. Anywhere where the electric field is in the same direction, there's no possible way they can add to zero. Then, Look at the other two points and then compare relative magnitudes and think about things like the charge. This is 15 microcoulombs, this one's 10. And I think you'll find that only one of those other points is it possible for them to add to zero. But you have to decide which. Number seven. This question is designed to basically just test on whether or not you can sketch electric field vectors, and it's designed to test you a little bit on how vectors add. So what you're going to do here is draw three electric field vectors at P, and then decide if you can tell whether the uh, horizontal component of the electric field is to the right or the left. And again, based on if these charges were all equal magnitude.
this is testing you on Lenz's law. So the system shown below, which way does the magnet move right or left to produce a current in the right through the resistor? So imagine right, you got a current to the right through this resistor. Then ask yourself, okay, what must be happening here? Or if you have trouble reverse engineering these problems, go to the magnet. Maybe this would be easier. And imagine the magnet moving to the right. Why right? I'm just picking a direction. And then ask yourself, what direction is the field here? Would the magnetic flux be increasing or decreasing? What direction then would I get a current here? And you should be able to tell then whether the magnet needs to move right or left. That's probably the easier way to do that. Nine, this is, this is just testing you on uh, if you understand the relationships between potential and electric fields. And I always make every student ever, that I have, always, at least I try to remember to make them remember one magic sentence. Electric potential always decreases in the direction of the field. So that means in the picture, the electric potential decreases when you go this way, increases when you go this way, and when you go this way, what happens? Nothing, Nothing no change. Let's see, a bunch of light bulbs here. And again, this is on the no calculator part of the test. This is going to be a conceptual question. Consider the system bulbs. Is the potential difference between A and B greater with the switch opened or closed? So I love conceptual questions like this. Um, I mean, one thing you could do, however, I, you know, I, I I would hesitate for you to do it this way. It was meant to be a conceptual question, but I mean, I guess all the resistors are given. You could calculate the current and then do the IRs to there. And then when you close the switch, this there's no current here, it's an equipotential, then figure out the current and do the IR. But this was not meant to be that much work Ask yourself this, is the resistance higher from here to here with the switch open or closed? And that will tell you what will happen to the current across this bulb. And then see if you can answer the question from that. All right, so that's kind of the take home or the, the no calculator part of the test. Let's talk about the rest of this thing. Okay, five, there's probably eight or 10 problems, choose five. I like to do that on exams. I'm kind of a believer in show me what you learned and uh, give you a little bit of freedom to skip some topics that maybe you didn't uh, do as well in. Um, so this one right here is definitely tested on your ability to uh, describe magnetic fields around wires. This is a five, oops. This is a 5 amp current going away from you, 10 amp current towards you. Remember the field lines around wires are circular. And a little reminder, the field intensity is mu sub o over 2 pi i over r. By the way, the other, the other part of the test was no notes. This one you can have one page. Eight and a half by 11. And you can write on all six sides. All six. All six. Yeah. What does that mean? Oh, think about a page and the geometry of it. I'm thinking about it like a like a box. Can I buy a, a thick box? Yeah. You write on all six sides? Yep. Yeah. Anyway, um, you can write, you know, equations like this are just fine. No examples, no pictures. Similar type of thing, testing you on how to draw electric field vectors. We're drawing the electric field vectors at the center. That's here. Use symmetry where appropriate. I think you'll find this problem is reasonably short if you apply some symmetry. Like, 
I wouldn't try to do this in coordinates like this. Do it in coordinates like this. And you'll see why after you draw all the vectors. All right, number three, find the electric field needed to stop a proton traveling at 10 to the 7th meter per second through a distance of 2 centimeters. And then what is the potential difference? This is an energy question, no doubt about it. Start with a picture. You know, we have a proton. It's moving pretty fast. What, 10 to the 7th meter per second? Now, what direction you put this in your picture is irrelevant. Put it anywhere, any direction you want. And it's about, you know, what electric field do we need to stop it? So... I mean, here's a good conceptual question. Based on the picture I have, what direction would the electric field need to be to stop it? Yeah, the electric field vector would have to point to the left. As it's stopping, then, is it moving towards higher or lower potential? Lower. Lower. Here's another conceptual question. What direction magnetic field would be needed to stop that? So what do we remember about the magnetic force on a charged particle? It's given by, remember, V sweep towards B. Mm -hmm. But the magnetic force, what's always the angle between the V and the B? Mm -hmm. So what will happen to the speed? When your force makes a right angle to your velocity, what happens to your speed? It is accelerating, but what's happening to your speed? It's constant. No, it's... Yeah. Yeah, the speed is constant. For, you know, the relationship between force and velocity is very important, right? When your force is in the direction of your velocity, the object will speed up, and the work done is positive, increasing your kinetic energy. When you have an object like moving this way with a force in the opposite direction, it will slow down. The work done is negative, and the kinetic energy is dropping. But when the object's going like this and the force makes a right angle, no work done. Remember, remember all the way back to physics one. Only forces in the direction of motion do work. Magnetic forces don't do any work. That's why there's no energy equations for them. Because they don't do work. There's no potential energy terms for them. All they do, they're centripetal forces. They'll, they'll create those V squared over R accelerations. So anyway, this one can be done using work and energy principles. Okay, a circuit. Find the charge on the capacitor. Okay, always pay attention to these, especially when there's capacitors around. A long time. Now, just think about the behavior of capacitors when you, when you put a DC voltage on them. What happens to their charge? They, if you put a DC voltage on them, their charge will go to some value, and once they hit a max value, then what's happening to the current? Zero. Zero. So then how many currents are there in this circuit with the switch closed a long time down the road? One. One. Right, and it will follow this path right there. Then what's the voltage across that resistor? Whoops, for you folks just watching the video. Then what's the voltage across that resistor when that occurs? Nothing. Zero, yeah. So when you work that, keep that in mind. This is a Gauss's law question. Find an expression for E as a function of R, 0 to A. All right, Gauss's law, that's been a long time. Um, so I'm not going to go through this right now. I know I have videos on this exact thing. I would suggest you maybe go review that before Monday and come find me next week if you're having trouble. But it has to do with you draw a Gaussian surface in here. You mimic the geometry. Remember that? And then you say, well, you know, the electric field is probably radially outward. You write down this, the total flux, which is equal to the sum of all the E, A, cosine, thetas, is equal to 4 pi K times the charge inside the surface. No, that was a long time ago. Seems like forever ago, huh? Take a chance and go through those videos and review Gauss's Law. 
and I'll try to find questions. You know, I'll try to make sure that any Gauss's law questions for the final are not super horrible. Again, this is why I did kind of an eight choose five. Okay, remember when we did the magnetism test and I told you, I pretty well guarantee you there's a, going to be a question on there like this. And, and I guarantee you there's going to be questions similar to this on the final exam. This is kind of like one of these fundamental problems that just really every physics class should see over and over and over. There's really a lot here going on here. And there's a lot to kind of learn about magnetism. And one important thing, being able to calculate the magnitude and direction of a magnetic force is important. So, you know, be sure in this picture with the given magnetic field vector, which is in the plus K, can you find the magnetic force direction on every one of these? Okay. Another important thing is that this loop, remember, has a property called magnetic moment. And what do we remember about magnetic moment and its direction? It's always what? Perpendicular, Perpendicular to the areas. And you tell which one by right-hand rule. So is the magnetic moment in this one going to be kind of like back and right or front and left? Yeah, it's the, it's the back and right one here. Because of the current? Yep. And then, you know, torque equations, right? Torque is IA cross B. I'm just, I don't know if this question even asks for that, but I mean, usually they do. And one of the, again, one of the reasons why I like to talk about problems like this, it also gives you a little insight into atoms. Okay, because an atom has a magnetic moment to it, typically, from the electrons orbiting and from the nucleus, rotation of the nucleus. So atoms themselves have magnetic moment. So you can typically put a torque on an atom if it's in a magnetic field. So I, I like problems like this because, one, it describes big macroscopic things, forces and, um, and torques and whatnot, but it also gives you insight into the atomic world, too. And that comes with time. One thing about physics is it's hard to really thoroughly understand all of these things kind of the first time around. Whoa, what the heck just happened there? Oh, question B. Yeah, what is the angle between the B field and the magnetic moment? Yeah, so remember the magnetic moment's going to go this way. What I would do is draw a picture top view. And keep in mind that the magnetic field is in the plus K direction, right? So that's like this way. So right off hand, is the field or the angle between the magnetic moment and the magnetic field going to be bigger than 90 or less than 90? Yeah, it's going to be, you're looking for something bigger than 90. Can we do 90 Say what? Can we do 90 plus 60? I'm not going to, I don't remember. It's already off the page, but I'll let you folks figure that out. You folks ask each other. Okay, let's see. An LRC circuit. Always start a circuit picture with a you know, draw the circuit. So an LRC circuit has an inductor and a resistor and a capacitor. It is driven by an AC voltage source, a 170, by the way. So basically, what's that probably driven off of? Um, like an outlet. An AC, yeah. Uh, the U.S. power grid is about 170 volts. The 120, remember, is on our RMS voltage. Ah, but it's not a it's not a pure U.S. problem apparently because it says what frequency will result in. So the U.S. power grid is a 170 volt 60 hertz power grid, with the 120 being the RMS voltage. This is we'll call it a semi U.S. 170 at some unknown frequency. Okay, so. Draw the phasor diagram for it. Oh, right in the directions, right. And then use the phasor diagram to come up with an expression for the impedance. And by the way, you should be able to get the impedance right from this too, by the way. We know there's a two amp RMS current. Right, so just a quick little review. You've got, you know, like V equals IR for resistors, V equals I X sub L for inductors, I X sub C for capacitors. <laughs> that was an L. And for the entire circuit, I Z. 
this is what we call the impedance. I like to think of it as the overall total resistance, all things taken into account. And this was given in the question, or the problem, the current. And you need to kind of, you know, calculate the voltage. Right? You can't use a peak voltage with an RMS current. So just keep that in mind. So you should be able to get the impedance of this no problem and work it backwards to get the rest of it. I'll be grading your AC that AC circuit quiz very, very soon. I just didn't get to it quite today, but yeah? Maybe. Oh, absolutely. We're just about done here um, with the review part. Okay, so a concave mirror with a given focal length and a lens. So, you know, start this definitely with a picture. Concave, convex, cave. I think that's that lens or that mirror. And then a lens with a positive focal point. Draw better pictures than mine with an object placed halfway between them. So what you do here, start with <clears throat> this problem. Just ignore the lens and do the mirror. And you can use the thin lens equation, you know, 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F. I like to call it the, the, the lens slash mirror equation. Figure out where the image is. If the image ends up anywhere to the right of the lens, you can then consider it a real object for the lens. If it ends up over here somewhere, it will be a virtual object for the lens. Oh, looks like that's all eight. Okay, so that's, you know, um, re pretty reasonable start. If you know how to do all the problems and questions on this test, you know, your final exam is going to... We'll test you on all those same principles. Just I'll word it like that, right? And you'll have three hours to do it. So, so endeth the re review. I'm going to let you folks work on this stuff. Ask questions as needed. So I think I'll stop the video and go ahead and post it. For you folks just watching the video, feel please feel free to send me requests. I can make videos at any time here between now and next week. And I also let everybody know that uh, I'll be having office hours on campus Monday. Happy to meet with you if you're having issues. Okay, let's get this ended.